I know you. Because I've been a pastor for, I've been in pastoral ministry for 48 years. I served local churches for about 45 of those years. And I know who comes to church on Friday night. (laughs) Right? I know you. You're the people who love the Lord. You love your pastors. You love your church. And uh, and you have a, a high trust. And you're hungry. And you never get tired of the good things of God. And the Lord reminded me of all those things as we were worshiping and I spent my whole afternoon preparing for a sermon and he laid it aside and so I'm going to give you another sermon. Um, I had, I'm supposed to come talk to you about covenant. So here's what's going to happen tonight. And tomorrow night and on uh, Sunday morning, I'm going to spend my time talking to you about how Christ inaugurated the new covenant, how he became the Passover lamb. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to do a, a, a seminar in the two hours that I have on revival. I love revival. I did my doctoral research on revival and um, actually on perpetuating revival in in a local church movement. And everywhere I go, Christians are wanting revival. And just so you know, every chance I get, I go to a place where there's been revival on the way here to see you. Uh, my wife and I stopped at Asbury and went to the chapel and prayed and, and went around the campus. And, and then two days later, we went to Cane Ridge, the site of the Cane Ridge Revival. Um, how many of you know about the Cane Ridge Revival? Okay, that's what Jesus did in Kentucky when Finney was turning New York upside down. When I leave you, I go down uh, uh, to minister with uh, some more friends that all they talk about is the the Finney revivals. And so I I love revival. I was born again during revival. I didn't know it was a revival. That's a beautiful thing. I didn't know it was a revival. Then I spent my whole life saying, I wish I was in a revival. I wish I was in the revival. And then when I studied revival, I found out I got born again in a revival. (laughs) And then... My wife and I have a a dear friend who's with the Lord. Her name is Barbara Martin. She's a a native of Boston. And uh, y'all will forgive me, but she and I share a love for the Red Sox. Just sorry, that's the way it is. (laughs) And uh, can't have everything. And Barbara was uh, most... She was... We called her Crazy Barbara. Um, When we took our church, uh, Barbara was with another pastor, and that pastor came to be my associate, and they came in and joined us in our church. We, uh, We, Gail and I, began a church called New Life City, uh, in in the year 2000, we actually began that church. First time, our first meetings were, I think it was the last day of the last day of July was our first meeting in a park in the year 2000. And and and, uh, and by October 1st, Barbara and some other people came over. And, and it, let me tell you about Barbara, because I, I just mentioned Jubilee. You know, y'all know Jubilee is liberty, right? Freedom, liberty. S- slaves go free. Debts go, go away. And, and I'm not kidding around when I say my wife and I are, are in our Jubilee. We're celebrating it every day. We didn't, we're not waiting until our 50th anniversary date. We're going to grab that 50th year. 
Well, Barbara had a jubilee. She turned 50 on January the 20th, 1994. Anybody know that date? Oh, <laughs> that's when God poured his spirit out on Toronto. Y'all heard of that? Yeah. A little church called Airport Christian Fellowship. <laughs> and uh, and uh, our, my mentor, our mentor, Randy Clark, was the one that sparked that. But Barbara, let me tell you how she was. Barbara, she just loved the Holy Spirit. She just loved everything God did. And she was... She would, be, she would be right here in our church every time the doors were open and she would be dancing and she was, she was on oxygen because she had a lung condition and she would take off her oxygen mask and <laughs> spin it around while she could, so she could dance during church. And, and Barbara had a big, thick, frizzy hair and a hook nose and she, everybody was like scared of her when they saw her. They were like, whoa! is that and Barbara said God gave the whole world a jubilee on my 50th birthday that was Barbara that tells you everything you need to know about Barbara Barbara said it was for me it was for me and and she just loved it and Barbara was one she was prophetic and and intercessory and Barbara would just have have dreams all the time and she would meet me at the door on Sunday morning, and she would say, Alan, have you got a minute? And I'm like, there's no saying no to Barbara. <laughs> and then she would tell me her dream and tell me her vision and tell me what God was saying. And then she would say, you know? And I would look at her and go, uh-huh. And she would walk away, and I'd go, I don't have any idea what she just said. <laughs> I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? I, and... Barbara, I thought about her so much tonight. Barbara got up on a Sunday morning in our church, and she was a, you know, she had all the favor in the world, so she just came up and told me to give her the microphone, and I gave her the microphone, and Barbara gave a testimony about joy in her life. Most beautiful testimony ever and sat down and I did understand that by the way and she sat down and I'm I'm whatever I was doing next and she came back up and took the microphone out of my hand and 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 spoke to us out of a psalm and put a you know punctuate she said I just have one more thing and then you don't ever have to listen to me again and it was beautiful, and it was Barbara. We, we love Barbara. By the way, I love the fact that people would come in as visitors, and she scared them to death. Because I knew if you could pass the Barbara test, you were going to be fine at our church. <laughs> and if you couldn't, you were going to leave anyway. So that was... <laughs> I'm just saying. And the next Saturday night, Gail and I were at a wedding, and my lead elder comes to church, and Barbara was not there. He told his wife, let's go find Barbara. And they drove to her house and got in her house and found her on the floor, already with the Lord. Just one more word, and you don't ever have to listen to me again. Her last hour was excellent excellent and i loved it when we had her funeral and people one after another would come up and say give me the mic <laughs> and they would all say the same thing the first time barbara spoke to me or the first time i saw barbara i was like ooh, ooh, ooh. and then they would say and then barbara spoke to me and they would have encounters with holy spirit she healed more people, did un unbelievable things. 
Oh, how we, we loved her. But it's appointed to man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Do you live with a sense of the divine appointment in your life? I'm going to put my do not disturb on. Hallelujah. Do you, do you live with it? Because I'm going to talk to you about the hour. I'm going to talk to you about an hour that Jesus had, his appointment with death. I'm going to talk to you about how he talked about it. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, how he ministered to people over it. John's gospel captures this thing so well. And I, after, after I left pastoral ministry, We have so much in common with you guys as a church family and with your founding pastors and the family and having, having transitioned our church. And our transitions were about the same time. And it's like the hardest thing I ever did, you know. And when I went out, it was crazy how God began to open up the scripture to me. And he began to open up the scripture to me about the death of Christ just obsessively about the death of Christ and specifically about the Lord's Supper, the communion. Because you do know that the Lord's Supper is the inauguration of the new covenant. And every time you receive the supper, you renew the covenant. You are a covenant people. And the meaning of covenant is family. Every time you study covenant in the Bible, you're studying how God makes family. Covenant is how God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. Well, Jesus spoke of an hour that was coming and an hour that no one could hurry and no one could delay. But it was coming. And he lived with a keen sense of awareness of it. And John the Apostle writes his gospel very much with an awareness of that, of that sense that Jesus had about the hour. And so he literally gives us an exposition of, of the hour. So, and the first thing we learn about it is these two verses right here in John 7 and 8. I'm going to allude to them more than read them. Because these are the two verses that nail it down for us. That the hour being spoken of was the hour of his arrest, trial, death, and burial, and resurrection. That's what he's speaking of. It was his destiny, what he, was, what he had come for. When we think of our destiny, we always think of glory. So did Jesus. He just had a different value of glory. As we will see in this book. And so, in two instances here, here's seven and eight, it says no one could arrest him. No one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. He was untouchable because the hour hadn't come. So what, what is that hour and how did he understand it? Because he unpacked it for them. So let's, let's unpack that. In John chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, that suggestively says there, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, hallelujah, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Awesome. I mean, first of all, if, you're, if you read the Gospel of John, if the first chapter didn't blow your mind, the second chapter has to go, what? They have no wine. Woman, what does that have to do with me? Now, I'm from the South, and we get offended when we read that. Jesus shouldn't talk to his mama like that. But you, you need to know that in biblical times, he was talking normally to his mother. It was not offensive. Just saying. Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you, right? Do whatever he tells you. 
So Mary is the one, the one person in the world living with a secret. Not the one, I mean, Joseph knew, living with a secret. This young man has a supernatural birth, and he's 30 years old. And she's being a pushy Jewish mama. <laughs> she's like giving him a push. And Jesus provides wine for the wedding feast. And I, I've heard lots of ways preached about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you look at it a fresh way tonight. In John 2.10, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you've kept the good wine till now. This was the first of his signs. Say signs. That Jesus did in Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory. The book of John can be divided and is by some scholars divided into two books. Chapters 1 to 12, the book of signs. And all the miracles that John records, he calls them signs. They're recorded as signs. These are indicators of something greater. Chapter 13 to the end of the book is the book of glory. So the signs are pointed toward the time of the glory. The other thing is, those first 12 chapters are also arranged around three Passovers. The reason people take Jesus' ministry to be about three to three and a half years is because the arrangement of John nails it down for us that we know that he had at least three Passovers during his ministry. So, so John takes a few things, packs them into a tight package, and it's, and it's three years. And then he takes the, the second half of his gospel, and it's about a week. It's tightly packed. But the first three years, he gives, us, he gives us these signs. Everyone serves the good wine first when people have drunk freely the poor. But you have saved the good till now. This is the first of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory. And the Bible says, and his disciples believed him. Now, most people make the wrong thing out of that. And I've struggled with it myself over the years. And listen, you can be a pastor a long time, and you come to a passage, you go, yeah, I don't know, real, but I really know. <laughs> and once you retire, you can admit that. <laughs> but when you're pastoring, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I love people do expository preaching, and, and you, can, you can tell they, they skip over the hard passages. There's some hard stuff in the Bible, and this is hard. Like, this is hard. Like, wh why is that? So, the, the, the message is there. The best wine is supposed to be last. Watch this. Woman, my hour has not yet come. He said, woman, my hour has not come. And she said, and, and then he did, he obeyed her request, and he gave them the best wine. And he gave it to them last. Because when Jesus' hour comes, he will give the very best wine for the wedding feast. Hallelujah. When his hour came, you, you need to know, I'm telling you, I, I already, some of your minds went all into the future. I didn't take it to the future. We will see it. John chapter 4, woman at the well. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Remember, he's having the discussion with her. And um, he's blowing her mind. And I, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, watch this, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming 
when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. I love that, but watch this. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in, the, in spirit and truth. For, this is not, by the way, in attitude. <laughs> For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one's called Christ. When He comes, He'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Jesus said, I am, is what he said. Now watch this. When the hour comes, Messiah will provide worship in spirit and truth. You can't worship in spirit till you have the spirit. Because God is spirit. He's worshipped accordingly. This is not worship in a good attitude. This is worship in the Holy Spirit. This is, this is having, this is having, let me say, this is God providing God's self to us. That's what this is. And they'll come to know that truth. Watch how it packs together. John chapter 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, now we're, we're in a discussion that Jesus is having. An hour is coming, and now is here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, He has granted that the Son would have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Again, I'm close to a Passover here. Number three. When the hour comes, the Son of Man, the Son of God, will provide the word that raises the dead. Get it now. Get it. He's going to provide (laughs) wine. He's going to provide worship. He's going to provide word. The best wine, the best worship, the best word, the word that raises the dead. This is Jesus. This is all he's going to do for us. This is Jesus living in light of an hour. An hour that was inside of him. Jesus living in light of an hour. When I I did stop pastoring, I started visiting churches and it broke my heart. Because I I literally, I would hear the messages and I would say to myself, "Why, Why did these people come here? Because here's what would happen. The worshipers would come. The worshipers would come. And boy, we would be in the throne room. And I want you to know something. It didn't matter if it was hymns or songs or ditties or choruses or what it was. Man, the worshipers were singing about Jesus. They were centered on Jesus. It was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the preachers, man, it was initiatives they had for their church. And it was COVID politics. And it was... And it was all the other kind of politics, and it was the world going to wherever it's going, and it was and it was all this that and God, Pastor, I went through I went through whole sermons and never heard his name, and then they would have the audacity to get up there and sing what they called an invitation song, and I would be like, "What are you inviting them to?" And I would say, if ever there was an hour that we need to have Jesus elevated, if ever there's an hour that we need to see Jesus, if ever there's a time that His glory needs to have. And I said, Lord, what's wrong? What's going on here? Why, where, where, what's wrong? And the Lord said, He literally, the Lord spoke to me and said, they've replaced my table with their table. 
And they took me out of the center and they put them in the center. And it's no surprise that it's a project that's failing. It's failing miserably. You know, you think about it now. We've just gone through an hour, a period of time, a crisis, the kind of time that should make people think about life and death, the kind of time that should make people fear the Lord, the kind of time that should make people press into, is there any hope? And church attendance is plummeting. And I'm, I'm one of the guys, and so I'm like, <laughs> we're apparently we're not offering him. <laughs> yes, we need revival. Yes, we need revival, but... Revival is when Christ is the center of all things. When Christ is the best wine. He is the best worship. He is the best word. Jesus didn't come to offer us anything but himself. (laughs) John begins with a wonderful phrase. I'll probably come to it in a minute. But in John 3.35... We read a text that gets overlooked all the time. It says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. He's everything. He's everything. He's everything. And so I so wonder when, when somebody meets Him, they, they have such a song in their heart. We have to have new Christians around us because because we have to be reminded of our first love by those who have the fragrance of Christ upon them. Well, Jesus, I've just taken you through chapter 2, chapter um, 4, chapter 5, and then I haven't gotten to 7 and 8 because 6 is in between. And here's what we're going to get to. The reason they wanted to kill him is what he said in chapter 6. You'll remember it. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying in verse um, 52, chapter 6, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. No life. Whoever feeds on my flesh... And drinks my blood, has eternal life. And I'll raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Listen, I kind of want to kill him too when I read that. (laughs) Right? I mean, this is weird. And we don't know, we don't know the end from the beginning. If you're going through that, you're like, what is wrong with him? I give you Leviticus uh, 17.10 up there because in Leviticus 17.10 it says the life is in the blood. For this reason, one of the things that we we forget is that Jewish people didn't ever eat anything with the blood in it. They they never ate any medium rare meat. All their meat was well done. And and their sacrifices were, (laughs) were burned up. And the Passover lamb was all the blood was drained and then it was cooked well done and they ate it because as Leviticus says the life is in the blood you don't eat the blood of an animal was the idea you don't ingest that life you don't become one with that life that was that was why it was forbidden and second Samuel I don't really have time for that one but hallelujah Invite me back. (laughs) Shameless. My wife says, that's him. He's just terrible. He's terrible. John chapter 6, verse 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. I mean, we always preach on the passage, abide in me. and My words abide in you. But here he says, feed on my flesh, drink my blood, and you will abide in me. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like 
the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught them in, Cap- in Capernaum. And so this is Jesus giving a sermon on eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And uh, you know what happened. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a really hard saying. We can't, who can listen to this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, by now everybody's gone. He's had a end of his revival. But Jesus, knowing himself, that the disciples were grumbling about this. I always love that when he calls them out. Do you take offense at this? Now, now get that inside of you. The spirit of offense is what kills revival. I'll come to that tomorrow. But the spirit of offense is what kills revival. And God loves to offend us. I mean, he just, he, listen, I got saved and I was so religious. I, when I heard about Toronto and heard they were laughing, I'd studied revival up to then. And I, and I didn't, I thought revival was, was all repentance and tears and hating yourself and, and counting your sins and, you know. And I'm heard they're laughing and they call it a revival. That's not God, says the all-knowing one. I'll tell you what, this week I was at Global. Are we in a hurry? Because I might, you might, you might. <laughs> there was, a, there was a, um, a couple there. They were doctors from uh, Brazil, and, and the wife didn't speak English very well at all. And the man did. He was a plastic surgeon. She was a pediatrician. But they were having a revival among the youth in their church, and they were the youth pastors of their church. And so they came to Global because they had to learn about the Holy Spirit. And I'm doing impartation, like, like in the last time. The, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, I was tired, because there's 140, 30 to 40 people there, and my job was to pray for every one of them. And, and uh, I'm not that spiritual. <laughs> and, and, and I come to them, and I, you know, I can, you can see her face, but she didn't understand very much. So I start talking to her, honestly, in a fatherly way. And she was a lovely young lady, and I'm talking to her, and she starts to cry. And I spoke to him: "Is is this is is, it, is she all right? Yeah." And he's trying to tell her what I'm saying, and then I lay hands on her. And suddenly, she just exploded in laughter and fell back and fell to the floor. And all of her tears turned to hilarious, hilarious laughter. And her husband says to me, she told me that she thought that was fake. (laughs) She, She told me that, she said... She didn't think. It, she said she didn't think anything would happen to her, and and that she and that she thought it was all. She thought it was all fake. <laughs> I ran into him at breakfast in the hotel the next day. I was so happy, and they were laughing and crying still, and and so excited about going home because they didn't just come to learn about Holy Spirit, but to experience, to taste, and see that He is good. And you understand, Jesus is saying, I want you to taste and see that I'm good. I want this visceral, this eating and drinking, this visceral, you're receiving me. You're becoming one with me. Jesus, knowing in himself, the disciples were grumbling about this, so you take offense at this. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? That's awesome. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh props nothing at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who don't believe. All right. Y'all still with me so far? So we're talking about the hour. We're, we got to get there. We got to get there. Hallelujah. My wife says, try to get there before the hour's over. 
She's the canary in the coal mine. When she dies, I have to stop. <laughs> you can't get this stuff just anywhere, folks. <laughs> John 12, 20. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Oh, this is good. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. I don't know whether he gave us all that detail, but it's beautiful. And Jesus answered them, Watch this. The hour has come. What? The hour has come. Ooh. First of all, let's figure out who these Greeks are. I don't have a lot of time, but the Greeks were probably God-fearers who were participating in the synagogues out in the nations where the Jews had been scattered. And these were people who, you know, listen, the Jews would come to feast. This was, uh, this was Voice of the Apostles. They'd come to the Voice of the Apostles conference every year. And they'd, they'd tell me, you, you, there's nothing so amazing as, uh, as Passover in Jerusalem. And so these guys come. And then when they come, they're hearing about Jesus. And then here come the Greeks. We say, well, what's significant about that? Well, if you understand the book of Isaiah, yes, that's how you say it. If you understand that book, then chapter 40 to 53 is this passage of the suffering servant. And then when you... When you come to chapter 53, it's the apex of the servant's suffering, and it brings you to chapter 54, and suddenly something happened. Sing, O barren woman, and you have not borne fruit. He starts telling them that the barren woman is going to have children. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Because what happens is, when the servant suffers, the next thing that happens is the Gentiles come in. And so Jesus, knowing what time it is, sees the Gentiles and says the hour has come. It's just right. It's just right. The hour has come. Now is the hour come for what? The Son of Man to be glorified the book of signs is coming to a close truly i say to you unless a grain of wheat fall to the earth and dies it remains alone but if it dies it bears much fruit whoever loses his life uh, or loves his life loses it whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me he must follow me where i am there will be my servant also if anyone serves me my father will honor him Hallelujah. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Here's the hour again. But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. No, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I've glorified it and will glorify it again. And I'm going to teach you a revival lesson right now. I've glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there heard it and said that it thundered. Got it? A voice from heaven. This hadn't happened since Sinai. A voice from heaven. And people of faith are like, God spoke to us. And the people with no faith said, did you hear it thunder? This is what revival is like. Signs and wonders can happen in the face of people who don't believe and they say it's nothing. And the people who have faith say, the glory of God has come among us. Same thing. This was the same thing on the day of Pentecost when that fire was on their heads. I'll guarantee you only a few people saw it. This is the reality of revival. Revival looks to some like the glory of God, and it looks to others like the mess of the world. And that's just the way it'll be. That's the way it'll always be. Why do we want revival then to come? Because the hungry get stirred, and they get fed. Now watch what this is. 
When the hour comes, the Son of Man falls to the ground like a grain of wheat, providing much fruit. All right, now let's just mess with this a minute. We're evangelicals, we're charismatics, we're Pentecostals, we're, people, we're witnesses of Jesus. And so we go, much fruit. That's evangelism, right? Let's interpret the Bible a little more literally. What is the fruit of wheat? Bread. Bread. The bread of life. The bread that Jesus has talked about all the way through the scriptures. The bread that he's been giving them information about. He came to provide the best wine. He came to provide the best worship. He came to provide the best word. And he comes to provide the best wheat. Food for us. And, yes, you didn't miss it. He, the capstone of that is bread and wine. The covenant meal. The meal that Jesus will share with them. Wine, worship, word, wheat. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. All right. We're close now. We're getting very close. Hallelujah. Chapter 13, the book of glory. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, look what it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, pastors. Hallelujah. During supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Jesus knowing, look what it says, that the Father had given all things into his hands. John 3.35, the Father loves the sons and gives all things into his hands. John 13 and 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Wow. Knowing. This is Jesus. Like, Knowing that everything is His. Everything is His. A man with nothing to prove. And that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper, laid aside his outer garment, and taking a towel, tied it to his waist. Hallelujah. This is our Jesus. Before I'm done this weekend, I'll take you through the rest of the story, but you know the story. Our Lord, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. And after the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And listen, this is a crazy thing. Jesus gave us a meal, a covenant meal. A meal that says, if you eat this bread and drink this cup, you belong to me and I belong to you. And I, to whom all things have been delivered, will care for you, will feed you, will see you through the hour of death. I, who have all things in my hands, will take you in my heart. This is our Jesus. And so he offers himself to us. Now, 
You say, this is a strange sermon for a Pentecostal preacher to give. I know. Hallelujah. I want to be like Jesus. I want to say things that cause people to go, what's he talking about? And that man's crazy, and I just think he's wrong. I, I, I really do, but I really want to say things that make, make people say, oh, I want him. I want him. I, I just want him. Church, there's no salvation in the American political system. There's no salvation in the American judicial system. There's no salvation in the American worldliness. Our salvation is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And our job is to so show forth the glory of Christ that people will say, man, I wish I was like you. It was the summer of 1972, and I was enrolled at Mississippi College as a freshman football player and going through two-a-day football practices. And I met a young man, his name was Anthony. And it was something just so different about him. It was offensively different. I couldn't tempt him. I couldn't test him. We couldn't seduce him into our ways. He was just placid and still and serene. And it bothered me so much, I went to him in the night and said, What's wrong with you, man? He didn't rebuke anybody. He didn't preach at anybody. He didn't act like he was better than anybody. He said, Hawk, it's just Jesus. I'm not anything. And he couldn't even tell me how to get saved. He didn't even know how to tell me how to pray the Jesus prayer. But I went away from that encounter, and within a week I was saying, God, can you do that for me? Because I don't know why he's like he is. And I don't want to be like I am. I want to be like he is. Jesus said to that woman, she was the first one that we met that he talked about the hour. She's wanting to stir him up, you know, in all kinds of ways. And she's offended at him. And, even, and then Jesus looks at her and says, woman, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask me. And I'd give you something to drink and you'd never be thirsty again. Oh, that we would learn to talk to our neighbors like that. Not like someone who is so offended at the evil of the world, but it's someone who is so in love with people that they, they come as someone with something wonderful to give. Hallelujah. Last thing, I promise. I'm going to... I'm going to spend these three days with you doing one thing. Trying to say to you that it's not hard to receive. And that God couched the gospel in the language of receiving. And he did it very specifically. Here is something to eat. It's me. Here is something to drink. It's me. And then he breathed on them. And he said, I want to give you my breath. And if we would just tell people that we came to Jesus through eating, drinking, and breathing... And then when I come back, I'll talk to you about sleeping. (laughs) This is the gospel. This is Jesus. This is our king. Would you stand together?
Hallelujah. I think it's Luke's gospel that tells us the last thing Jesus did on this earth. The last thing Jesus did on earth. It says he blessed them. He blessed them. You and I are in the image of Christ. And we have the power to bless. This is for blessing, not cursing. We have the power to bless. This wonderful lady's mother, when she met me, knew I was not a Christian and knew that I was after her daughter. And every time she saw me, she told me, Oh, Alan, do you know how much God loves you? Do you know the wonderful plans he has for your life? And because she spoke to me that way, I would sometimes find myself stopping by her house when I knew she wasn't home. Because here was an adult who would see me in Christ and not in my worldly flesh. She made me want to know the Christ that I came to know. Tomorrow will be a teaching morning. This weekend will be, if your pastor has told me, communion. And in every service, I'll pray for you. You're coming. Have you, what, what, what am I missing? I don't know the order of things. Are you, are you coming for prayer? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> You're doing what I do. That's what I do. That's what I do. That's what I do. And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to pray for you if you'll let me. And I just want to bless you. And uh, I tell people all the time, I'm not a prophet. But I have the power to bless. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, would you come and be among us? If you want to come for prayer, please come. Please come. My wife and perhaps others will come and we'll lay hands on you and pray for you. Hallelujah. Just be free. Just be free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't be compelled. Just be free. <laughs>